Um, hello, thanks everyone for coming. I'm Paul Shari from the Center for New American Security, where I co-direct the Ethical Autonomy Project there that's looking at how militaries are incorporating automation into future weapons. Um, we've got a screening of the new Terminator film. It's starting at 7 uh, tonight. But we're going to do a very wonky DC thing first. We're going to have a very sober policy discussion about uh, what militaries are actually doing in terms of incorporating more autonomy into weapons. Uh, right now, there are over 90 countries and non-state groups that have drones today that are controlled by people. People fly them, people make decisions about uh, whom to kill. But just like we're seeing automation incorporated into a wide variety of other industries, from self-driving cars to warehouse robots, uh, militaries are incorporating more autonomy into future weapons as well. So what happens when a predator has as much autonomy as a Google car? Uh, what are the moral and ethical and, and legal issues and safety concerns that come along with that? And what are things that we're comfortable automating and, and things that we're not? Um, we've got a great group of folks here uh, to talk through these issues. Joining me is Stuart Russell from UC Berkeley. Uh, he's a thought leader in the artificial intelligence community. Um, he's been a pioneer in the field of, of AI and was one of the co-authors of the recent open letter signed by over 3,000 now uh, AI and robotics experts calling for a ban on autonomous weapons. Uh, joining us is also Tom Malinowski, Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, who's had a long career working on human rights issues both inside and outside government. And uh, leading us in this conversation is going to be Missy Ryan from the Washington Post. Uh, and we'll have some time as well to turn to you for, for questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Missy to get us started. Thank you. Okay, is this on? All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. I hope everybody has their popcorn and is, re is ready for the, the movie as well as the discussion. Um, I'm Missy Ryan. I'm uh, one of the Pentagon correspondents for the Washington Post, and I'm really happy to be here um, along with such a distinguished group of panelists. Um, so we're going to start off and have a discussion among the panel here um, and then hopefully leave adequate time for your questions before we start uh, the film at around 7 p.m. So as Paul mentioned, this summer hundreds, thousands of scientists and technologists join, joined in an open letter warning against the development and use, the dangers of the development and use of autonomous weapons. They said that without proper regulation, that these sort of weapons could trigger a new arms race some of the signatories included uh, Stephen Hawking, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, and SpaceX founder Elon Musk. Even if it doesn't quite reach Skynet or John Connor proportions, um, certainly the fear that was articulated in this letter was that these weapons will be difficult con to control and easily to, easy to proliferate, sort of becoming the Kalashnikovs of tomorrow. The letter specifically appealed for a ban on offensive autonomous weapons beyond meaningful human control. And that's a pretty sp specific definition. Um, and uh, partly because of that, I'd like to start this evening with a few definitions, since I think uh, these terms may mean different things to different people. Um, so I'm going to ask Stuart here, who is um, a longtime uh, authority on AI issues, um, to tell us uh, when does a weapon become um, an autonomous weapon beyond human control. What's the difference between a predator drone and the Terminator? Um, so if you could just give us a couple examples and make sure that we're starting the conversation with a clear understanding of what these weapons are. Thank you, Missy. So um, I think many of you are familiar with uh, chess programs. Uh, and it's quite been quite a long time since a chess program beat the human world champion. That was 1997. Um, so if you wanted a non-autonomous chess program, what would that look like? Well, the chess program would look at the chessboard, see the move that Kasparov made, report back to the human expert who was guiding it. The human would say, OK, now you should move your knight. And the computer would say, great, I'm going to move my knight. OK, that would be a non-autonomous chess program. But chess programs don't work that way. They don't report back to a human. So they're not like drones at all. A drone is controlled, reports the image back to the human, and the human guides its motions and its release of weapons. So a fully autonomous weapon would be essentially like a chess program. It would see the board, i.e. the battlefield. It would decide which pieces to take, uh, i.e. who to kill. 
um, and it would carry through its mission uh, until the end when it checkmates the opponent, i.e. when it's uh, wiped out all of the enemies that its, uh, its mission set need to be wiped out. Uh, so we're all familiar with the idea that, that humans lose to chess programs. Uh, we just take the chessboard, expand that out to the battlefield, uh, which is certainly more complicated. Uh, there's a lot of fog of war. There are unknown unknowns, uh, in a famous phrase. Um, but uh, it's, these are really just um, changes in degree. Uh, the notion of autonomy is a very simple, straightforward idea of a system that can make decisions of uh, what's a target and who to kill. Great. Um, Paul, I'm going to ask you uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, can you tell us who, which country is farthest along in developing these weapons and what the weapons are? Um, and secondly, um, when you were at the Defense Department, you led the development of an official policy on this subject. Um, please tell us what that U.S. government policy is. Sure. Um, so the, I'd say the leading countries right now in this technology um, are the United States, Israel, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and China. Those six are um, leading in various ways the development of uh, various kinds of military robotics. To be clear, there are no countries saying they plan to build autonomous weapons that actually go out and decide uh, who to kill on their own. Um, but none of those six countries uh, have ruled them out either. Um, the, British government is perhaps the most on the fuzzy edge here in that they've made some statements to say that they won't, but the way they've defined uh, an autonomous weapon is such that it would be something like something we're seeing in a Terminator movie, something that is sentient and is human level thinking. Um, so they sort of defined it in a way that puts it very far out into the distant future. Just to interject, what is the most sophisticated uh, weapon that of the, of the ones that are being developed by the countries that you mentioned? So um, there are a couple countries developing next generation combat drones. Um, the UK has a system called the Tyrannus. Um, the US has um, uh, an experimental system called the X-47 and some uh, things on a drawing board for other uh, advanced kind of next generation combat drones. China has their own. Uh, France is developing one called the Neuron. Uh, those would all be things that still people would control uh, decisions about the use of force. The aircraft would fly themselves, but people would still be controlling them. There are some one-off examples, things that are not actually very sophisticated, um, but would cross the line to an autonomous weapon. The Israelis have a system called the Harpy that uh, flies around and hunts enemy radars. And that's been sold to a handful of countries, uh, Turkey, China, India, South Korea. It's not new, it's not actually very sophisticated, but it would cross the line to be an autonomous weapon. And the U.S. government policy? Sure. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, the Department of Defense released an official policy on the use of autonomy in weapons. Um, it's a long, sort of boring government document, but the, the short answer is it, it, um, it sort of defines what these types of things are. It says if you're going to build something that uses autonomy in ways we already have in the past, like a cruise missile or a torpedo, that's okay. Go ahead and do that. It says if you're going to do anything that's different, that's something we haven't done before, it, um, it puts in place uh, a series of sort of uh, guidelines that developers have to go through. And then they have to get approval from pretty senior levels in the Department of Defense. It has to be approved by uh, the two senior undersecretaries for technology and policy, and then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, so you know, sort of three very senior level officials have to approve it. And how far along is the Pentagon in developing any weapons that, beyond the, the uh, drones that you mentioned, are there any others that are on that sort of track? Um, not in terms of things that would be autonomous, which would cross the line. There are lots of things in development that would keep a person still in the loop. Okay. Um, Tom, uh, you've spent part of your career advocating for human rights outside of the government. Um, today, you're back inside government in a related role. Um, I'd like you to help us um, discuss the, the human rights issues that, um, the, that we're considering in relation to these weapons. Um, but first, can you briefly tell us where the international debate on this topic stands? I understand there um, has been some discussion at the United Nations about potential regulation. Um, and uh, as we said, there's um, a group of individuals who are advocating a ban. Um, well, the, th there is a debate now. And actually, you know, when you guys did the directive, uh, there wasn't a debate. It was one of the first times the government got ahead of 
uh, a debate in, uh, in civil society, and I think it was a really admirable effort to, to start an important conversation on this subject. The, um, the, the human rights community outside of government is basically where the 3,000 AI researchers are. They have called for uh, a global ban on offensive, uh, uh, fully autonomous of offensive um, uh, lethal weapons, and they have um, I introduced a discussion in the United Nations, in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, through the Convention on uh, Convention uh, Conventional Weapons, um, where um, I think we have just begun to wrestle uh, with these very, very deep and fateful uh, questions. Um, and the U.S. government's position on uh, on that conversation is that Frankly, we're not ready yet to make that decision. Um, it, is, it is an issue that has to be wrestled with, um, and we have to weigh um, the potential pros and cons of uh, developing um, these weapons. And, and I think you know, we'll have a chance to discuss probably both sides of that uh, question today. Sure. Um, first of all, can you just tell us what, what is the State Department role specifically in the development of that policy or that discussion that you said that will occur? Um, well, initially, this was a this was a question the DoD mm -hmm. faced, um, and you know, as you heard, basically, what DoD did was to to define uh, fully autonomous lethal weapons as a special category, um, as a category of weapons that um, can only be developed, setting aside actually deployed, um, following a very high level process of review, which has not, to my knowledge, actually. We, we haven't gone through that for any particular system. Um, I think the, the, the deeper question about whether these weapons can um, uh, abide by the principles of international humanitarian law, um, whether developing them is a good idea morally, ethically, strategically, um, that is a question that is going to have to be wrestled with um, not just in the Defense Department, but frankly, by the President, by the State Department, by, uh, by a whole range of people who think about these questions. And there are human rights implications. Sure. Well, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. Um, in 2012, uh, Human Rights Watch published a report um, that uh, articulated a case against killer robots, and uh, which said that, among other things, that fully autonomous weapons would be inconsistent with international law and could threaten civilians. Um, do you believe that um, there is a way to use such weapons in, in keeping with international law? And more importantly, can they be deployed in a more morally responsible way? Um, let, me, let me frame the question this way, um, because we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. We're going to be watching the Terminator. Um, I, I think one of the interesting things about this issue is that it, it has probably been the central theme in science fiction in the last 50 years. Should we, is it a good idea, far deeper question than just a strictly legal one, is it a good idea to give decision-making power to artificial intelligence, to robots, um, particularly the power to take human life? And if you watch these movies, you come away with, I think, one of two possible conclusions, certainly from the Terminator franchise. Conclusion number one is that would be a really bad idea. <laughs> Conclusion number two is it's inevitable. And no matter how many times they send someone back in time to warn us, um, you were actually sent back in time, isn't that? <laughs> no one believes him, but it's true. Like, yeah. um, it, it, it is, you, you can't un, unlearn the knowledge, and knowledge is inevitably applied uh, in technology, and that therefore the challenge before us is to figure out how to constrain, regulate the development and use of these systems so that we avoid the worst possible outcomes and maximize them the most positive possible uses of the technology. So that's, that's really the, the debate, because I think everybody recognizes that there are potentially problematic outcomes here. Now, the argument that you'll hear, just to sort of simplify it from the ethical standpoint, is on the one hand, people will say, it would actually be a really great thing if we had 
robotic warriors because they won't get tired, they won't get angry, they um, won't panic, they won't have the emotional reactions in combat that often will lead a human soldier to do terrible things to civilians. They will be able to make very discriminating decisions very quickly under pressure in ways that human beings find uh, hard to do. So if we program them with the rules of international humanitarian law, distinction, proportionality, all of that, which many argue should be possible eventually, if not now, then they will actually do better than humans at um, making ethical choices. And then on the other side, the argument is that these choices are not actually very simple. They're actually profoundly human. They're very complicated. Um, they involve weighing the relative. If you're making a proportionality decision, for example, under the laws of war, you actually have to weigh the value of a human life. And can a machine ever do that? Um, in the kinds of battlefields that we have recently experienced, where civilians and combatants are difficult to distinguish, combatants don't wear uniforms, civilians are often armed, um, could we ever train a machine to be able to make decisions, especially since that battlefield is constantly changing and adapting? And then, like you know, from, from the point of view of people who focus on human rights, there is the question of what happens if these weapons become so ubiquitous that they become available in large numbers to authoritarian regimes and terrorist groups. Um, and won't it be a tremendous advantage to a future Assad, for example, if he can have an army of um, <coughs> enforcers who will never refuse an order because they are machines, unlike a human being. And so that's, that's sort of the debate. Um, uh, Stuart, let me ask you from a technology uh, perspective, from an AI perspective, is it possible, um, as Tom was um, asking whether it would be eventually um, for a machine to weigh the value of a human life, to make judgments about proportionality, um, when, um, when will this be possible if it is? So I think it's much easier to build a machine that's extremely good at killing people um, I think, you know, take a matter of weeks to put together the various systems that have already been developed uh, and the software that's available for, for example, finding and tracking humans and images uh, and controlling the flight of an autonomous drone. Um, you could put together systems in weeks that I could, I could send out into Washington, D.C., uh, you know, and pick off uh, males between the age of uh, 18 and 45. Um, could I do that in a way that respected humanitarian law? Uh, that's a much more difficult question. I think the discrimination between uh, soldiers and civilians, uh, the systems will make mistakes, but humans make mistakes. And arguably, uh, at some point in probably not too distant future, uh, we might reach a point where uh, computers are as good as humans. Um, on the question of proportionality and, and military necessity, uh, those require an understanding of the entire strategic situation. Um, and uh, so, for example, uh, in the first Gulf War, when, uh, when the Iraqi troops were in full retreat uh, from Kuwait, uh, there was no military necessity to basically wipe out uh, the entire Iraqi army during that retreat. So, so I think there were serious questions about whether it would have been allowable uh, to destroy them when they're essentially running away from the battlefield. Um, it's quite difficult for machines to do that, and it would also be very difficult for them even to have access to the information to make those kinds of, of strategic decisions. Um, but I would also say that the, it's not quite the right question. And, and up to now, when, when, I, when I spoke at Geneva in April at, at the CCW meetings, um, the debate was really, well, you know, if we, if we take what a human soldier is doing now and we, we, we replace them with a robot, you know, perhaps uh, at some point when the robot technology gets better, uh, the robot can be more humane, more humanitarian, more accurate uh, than the human. Um, but that sort of one-for-one -one substitution is not what would happen. Uh, you know, a long time ago we had spears and we used them in certain circumstances. But the idea that, well, we would only use cruise missiles in exactly those same circumstances where someone would have thrown a spear, uh, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And the idea that we would only use 
autonomous weapons in the circumstance where we would have used a human before, uh, again, is, is not really uh, reasonable. Um, autonomous weapons can be made extremely cheaply and extreme, uh, in very, very large numbers, in the millions. Uh, and you can direct a force of millions of autonomous weapons with just a few people, uh, which is not the case. If I want to field millions of soldiers, I need tens of millions of support personnel, uh, entire industries to keep them going, uh, and so on. So it's a very, very different situation. Uh, and I think we could see autonomous weapons being um, a, a form of weapon of mass destruction, that uh, a very small group could use them to, to take on uh, you know, an army or a city or, or even an entire country. And that need for support uh, personnel actually may raise the bar for when ju uh, decisions are made about um, whether to use um, force, and that raises a, another as ethics question that I want to put to the panel um, to anybody who'd like to answer. Um, another objection that is raised um, to these weapons is that um, in some ways they would make it seem uh, that the use of force is less personal in a way that might allow governments to um, empl employ um, force or declare war more easily, resulting in a greater loss of life. Um, do you all agree with that? Um, and how do we know that this is actually the case? I mean, certainly, um, if to play devil's advocate, um, haven't we proved ourselves capable in the past of adapting to new technologies um, that are potentially very dangerous without um, necessarily, you know, as with the advent of the nuclear of the nuclear era, without sort of destroying the human race? Um, so I, we uh, we have a long history of uh, evil being done by humans, and one of the things that protects us to some extent is the fact that for massive amounts of evil to be done, uh, up to now, someone has had to convince massive numbers of people to go along with doing massive amounts of evil. And sure, that happened with uh, the Nazis in the 1930s, um, but it doesn't happen that often. Um, what these weapons would do would, would lower the barrier uh, so it's not just about uh, governments, it's about anyone with a moderate amount of money and a great deal of hatred uh, being able to acquire the power to do massive amounts of evil. Sure. Paul, did you want to? I think, I think there's a number of different concerns that come up, but I think this question of sort of human responsibility is an interesting one because it's, a, it's potentially sort of a more insidious problem that you might not see off the get-go, right? So it's not about physical distance or physical connection between a person and you know, a soldier and, and the person that they're killing on the battlefield. Um, we have lots of ways that increase that separation. And in many ways, technology has always been about getting further away from somebody else. And the first time somebody got a, picked up a rock and threw it at someone else. Um, we're using things like drones today that we have people piloting the drones to the other side of the planet. Um, and in fact, what really matters is the psychological distance. We've seen with drones, um, drone operators actually have quite a bit of psychological connection to the people they're seeing on the ground, much more so than, say, a, a fighter pilot whizzing by overhead. But I think there is something to this idea of if you had an, an autonomous weapon, would anyone feel responsible for the killing, right? Um, does that matter in a, in a lawful sense? Uh, maybe. Um, but from an ethical sense, it, it probably matters quite a bit. And, would that lead to more killing if no one felt responsible, right? Um, would that lead to people being more careless on the battlefield? Or even if it didn't, what would that mean for sort of the country and the nation that was employing those weapons if they were fighting and killing people and no one felt ethically or morally accountable for that, um, even if it was all lawful and, and no civilians were harmed? So I think there are some interesting and, and challenging issues there. Tom, how do you think we deal with the legal accountability question um, with the potential use of these weapons, whether it be through the you know, intentional results, the intentional violence that would be um, the result of uh, use of these weapons, or perhaps um, accidents or malfunctions or killing the wrong person? Uh, well, exactly, and that's a question to which I don't think anyone has an answer uh, at, at this point. So do you, would you hold the programmer accountable? Would you hold the commander who a human commander who sets into motion the use of uh, these weapons, or nobody at all. That's, that's a very legitimate question that people ask, and, and to which I don't think there, there is a good answer. Um, and then, you know, the more philosophical question is, would, we, would humans be comfortable with um, 
uh, being told that um, the death of a loved one was the result of a decision by, made by a machine. I mean, of course, we're not comfortable hearing about such a tragedy befalling someone we care about under any circumstances. Um, but would we react differently? Um, would we be less accepting if somebody told us, you know, a, a machine ran an AI program and made a determination that your husband or son or daughter was acceptable collateral damage because under a mathematical program that was the I think decision it that it made. Potentially cheapens the value of a human life. If well, of the decision. And yet, you know, and, and, and that could that could be true even if um, experts in international humanitarian law fully agreed with the decision that the AI made. That I, I think I, I wonder, this is a question, but I wonder if people would be as 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 accepting of such a decision if it were made artificially rather than by a human being who is taking responsibility for making a very difficult ethical judgment. Um, we just have a couple minutes before we're going to try to go to questions. So um, Stuart, just very quickly, um, one of the things that was raised in this recent letter was the idea that actually AI can be used to make the battlefield safer um, rather than uh, using uh, 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 creating potentially um, problematic tools for killing. How can that happen? Can you just give us a couple quick examples? Um, yeah, so AI can be used uh, to, to aid in uh, self-defense. So for example, you could, Im you could imagine uh, you know, essentially a kind of personal radar system which would warn you of, uh, of incoming missiles. So if you're uh, in Israel and there are missiles being fired from the Gaza Strip. Don't, uh, those, the, don't those exist yeah. already? Uh, not on a personal level. So I mean, the, Isra the Israeli army uh, stations them near the border mm -hmm. and uh, tries to shoot down. Like the, the Iron Dome. So that's the Iron Dome. Um, yeah, but but uh, for an individual soldier uh, or for a civilian, they could be uh, they could be warning. They could even be uh, perhaps a sort of a mobile shield that could be used um, for uh, for vehicles. There could be uh, AI which would help them avoid landmines. Um, so there are many ways that AI could be used. Um, and I understand, I mean, that there are various scientists within the AI community who feel a moral obligation to try to use AI to, uh, to reduce civilian casualties. Um, and they argue that, uh, that simply stopping the development of robot weapons uh, cuts off the possibility of, uh, of robots who would be uh, less prone to kill civilians uh, than human soldiers. Um, and my response to them is, you know, by all means use AI to reduce casualties, but introducing another category of weapons uh, that kill people and then saying, okay, well once that category of weapons is introduced, then we'll make them better uh, so that they'll kill less people, um, seems uh, a little bit naive because it's also uh, assuming that those weapons are always going to be used uh, so for those of you who've seen Interstellar, which I highly recommend, by the way, right, is it, you're assuming that all of those weapons are going to be used with a humanitarian setting on 100%. Um, but in fact, we're pretty sure that's not how they would be uh, used in practice. Um, so another uh, sort of, um, perhaps you might call it a fallacy, is that people say, well, um, wouldn't it be great if wars just consisted of robots fighting robots? Uh, then they could have their little battle and some robots would get destroyed and others, others would win, uh, and no people need to die at all. Uh, this is not how war actually works, right? The purpose of war is, crudely speaking, to force other people to do something that they really, really, really don't want to do, um, up to the point where they're willing to sacrifice their lives to not do it. Um, so after your robots have been defeated, then the enemy's robots are going to come for you. Uh, and so it's not as if humans can just wash their hands of war and leave it to the robots. It's not an adequate proxy. Okay, last question for anyone on the panel. Um, do you all think that an international treaty is the best way to deal with this issue, or can we rely on national self-regulation? Um, and why hasn't the U.S. government 
um, as of yet, led an effort to introduce an international ban on such weapons as uh, it did with the Biological Weapons Convention? Um, well, I can't answer it until we answer it. <laughs> um, we are, um, I, I think we are still at, the, at, fairly, at a fairly early stage in examining the full moral, strategic, practical ramifications of, of these questions. Um, we've laid down a marker with the directive, um, which, as I mentioned, walls these weapons off into a separate category. Um, there isn't yet a consensus um, about uh, whether the best way forward is um, attempting to regulate the development of these weapons or um, something more uh, extreme. I think there are, even among people who have very deep concerns about the potential uh, of this technology, there are very serious questions about the practicality of a, a global ban, and there are strong arguments on, on both sides uh, of that question. So first you have to ask yourselves, will we be better off or worse off if these weapons um, come into use in a, in a widespread way? If you believe we'll be worse off, you, also, you then have to wrestle with the question of what can be done about that. Where do you draw the line? Is it possible? Um, for countries that uh, care about human rights and the proper uh, application of force to uh, establish a norm that will be respected. And so we have to focus on both of those questions. OK, Paul, you want to have a quick last word? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say what you say. It's, uh, it's all sort of very grim stuff, but um, I think the fact that we're talking about this issue at all is, um, is really encouraging. I mean, the way this has worked in the past is humans invent some terrible thing, uh, like chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, and then we use it. And then afterwards, we're like, ooh, that was really horrible. Um, and we sort of try to cram it back in the bottle. And the fact that there are conversations going on among a number of countries, uh, NGOs are involved, uh, experts from the AI and robotics community are involved, is, is very encouraging. Um, and we didn't, we didn't need a time traveling robot from the future to come back and warn us. Um, I think that's, that's encouraging. OK, great. Well, we're going to open up to the audience. If you could just raise your hand. I think there are uh, at least one mic. Um, and please identify yourself. And um, uh, the, the gentleman there in the blue shirt. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Mellis. It seems like a lot of the development of policy that will govern how these weapons are developed will hinge on definitions and uh, specifics and you mentioned that one of the definitions that's at play is meaningful human control and in thinking about this it seems like we have systems like landmines that are out there that you set and they are they become somewhat outside human control they'll act under the under the parameters that they've been set to act in or you have things like the matrix where and, and terminator where the machines are able to replicate themselves and it becomes a, an exponentially growing problem. How would you define meaningful human control under these situations? I think that might be curious. Um, so on the question of landmines, I think uh, it's true. To some extent, they are autonomous weapons and uh, they have been banned. Uh, the US hasn't ratified the International Landmine Treaty, um, but has voluntarily restricted uh, the way their minds operate so that they, they essentially self-extinguish after a short period. Um, but it's precisely the fact that the mine uh, decides to kill somebody uh, without really knowing that that person is a legitimate target uh, is, is the <coughs> fundamental reason why they were banned. And, they were and of course, as we know, they were causing tens of thousands of civilian casualties every year, especially children. Um, so to say that uh, a system is under meaningful human control, there's a notion in international humanitarian law of an attack. So this means essentially some uh, release of a weapon against a particular target. Uh, and what most people mean by meaningful human control uh, is that every such attack uh, has to be made where the human is aware of what the target is, the circumstances of the attack, uh, and has sufficient information to determine that this is a legitimate target. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it'll never be perfect. But um, for example, deliberately launching a weapon when you don't have enough information to know 
whether something is a legitimate target uh, constitutes a war crime. All right. Uh, um, next question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Let me, let, let yeah. me take that on a little bit, too. Um, th there are different categories here that people talk about. And actually, the DOD directive lays, uh, lays some of them out. There, there is a category of weapons that, that uh, are referred to as semi-autonomous, which means that um, a human being uh, gives uh, an order that a particular target should be hit or a particular person should be killed and then sends the weapon out to go and do that. And perhaps the weapon determines the time, place, and manner um, when, that, uh, when that happens. That's actually the Terminator. And under Paul's directive, the Terminator, DOD could actually have the Terminator. And that's not subject to an additional layer of view. Is that correct? Well, um, <laughs> mm, let's say. There's a couple of complications there, right? This is an interagency discussion. Uh, the the Terminator, right? And the, I don't. I'm not going to spoil anything here to say that the Terminator in the first movie in the first movie in the first kills movie. a lot of people that are not his actual target. Um, so probably that would not be true with that caveat. Yeah. But the idea of, of <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 setting that aside, it's semi-autonomous. Then there's a category of weapons that they're basically on automatic mode, and some of these defensive weapons defending against incoming missiles are in this category, but where a human being has the opportunity to stop the use of that weapon at the last minute. Um, maybe you get you know, 10 seconds. Um, the weapon says, I will engage in 10 seconds unless you press the no button. So that's another category. And then what we refer to as fully autonomous weapons, the, the machine itself is deciding what targets to engage based on, hopefully, ethical programming, but not necessarily. Um, so the, the machine is deciding um, whether a human being um, lives or dies. And that's, I think, where some people feel we should um, draw the line. And that's where I think most of the debate um, has centered. Uh, Paul, aren't there um, at least a couple um, weapons that are now out there in use that could be used in a fully autonomous fashion, but that are currently used in a semi-autonomous fashion? Um, so th the only one that I'm aware of that clearly sort of crosses the line to an autonomous weapon is this um, Israeli radar hunting drone called the Harpy. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that it's used to search over a wide area and find, it only targets radars, it doesn't target people or vehicles. But it searches over a wide area and finds those radars, and then it, it kamikazes into them without asking for their permission. Um, I'd say there are a couple next generation missile systems that countries are developing that um, sort of raise this question. Um, there have been a number of, of activist groups, NGOs, that have uh, raised concerns about missiles that the US, the UK, or Norway are developing, and partly because sometimes the specific modes of the weapons might be somewhat opaque. Um, as an outsider, how do you know does it has a, an autonomous mode where it starts hunting for you know, targets on its own? It may not be clear. And the sort of interesting thing about this is it may not even be clear after the fact. Right? So if a weapon was used and it destroys a target, how would you know if it was a decision made by a person or if it was autonomous? It's not clear to me that you would even know afterwards unless someone told you and then you have to decide to trust them or not. I think there was a question in the front row here. Uh, hello, and thank you all for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, my name is Christine Vargas. I'm, I head marketing and PR for Avicent, which uh, is a management consultancy that often considers all of these issues. Um, I'm of uh, the pessimistic mind that because of international competition, we are facing some sort of fully autonomous, lethal uh, AI in the future, near future. And with that in mind, um, you have pop culture encouraging us to think about basic unmanned systems and robotics, uh, whether humanoid or animalistic in nature. But my question to the panel is, where are we going to surprise ourselves thanks to international competition? Are you going to have the Internet of Things you know, coming to life and cooking people inside their own houses, for example? Um, where do you think we're going to surprise ourselves, maybe both for the worse and the better? So um, you bring up an interesting point, which is uh, hacking. And uh, with, uh, with cl 
classical conventional weapons, tanks and so on, uh, it wouldn't be easy for one person by typing to uh, immobilize you know, the entire tank forces of the Soviet Union. Um, but if we have uh, autonomous weapons that are all networked, uh, then if the network is vulnerable uh, and people find a way to hack in, uh, you could uh, essentially um, render the, in the entire automated forces of a country uh, ineffective uh, in a very short period. So that creates uh, a risk of, of a total uh, change in the balance of power between countries uh, that can take place in, in a matter of seconds. Uh, and that's something to consider. Um, another interesting fact about autonomous weapons is once they start fighting each other, uh, and of course it's not just the US who would have these weapons, it's, it's all, all the other countries too. When autonomous weapons fight each other, uh, if they don't adapt, if they don't learn, if they don't change their strategic behavior, uh, they will be vulnerable because the other side will learn to predict how they behave and therefore will wipe them out. So it's obligatory to build in adaptation uh, into the way the weapons are designed. Uh, which also makes it impossible to predict how they're going to behave. Uh, that raises another level of uncertainty. Um, so it totally wipes out the idea of accountability because if you, by definition, can't predict how your system is going to behave, uh, then you, by definition, you can't be sure that uh, the mission you're sending it out on is going to be carried out uh, in the proper humanitarian way and that the scope of the mission is going to be uh, bounded and so on. So um, it's also the case that just, uh, just as um, technological surprise is something the US always worries about, that some will, someone will develop uh, a new category of weapons, like the Soviets developed um, their multiple warhead vehicles and their, uh, their mobile launching systems for nuclear missiles. Um, you could have a technological surprise simply from changes in the software that controls the, the weapons. So when you have uh, robot weapons fighting each other, uh, small differences in the software can outweigh uh, differences in the physic physical capabilities of the systems. And so again, you could have changes in the balance of power, not over a decade as, as happened with Soviet missile systems, but uh, over a space of hours uh, by reprogramming the software. All right, uh, the gentleman with the tie in the Next to Lester. My name is Chris Kohler, and um, I have a question um, regarding semantics. Um, the uh, State Department just defined fully autonomous weapons. Uh, is that same definition in the 2012 directive? Um, I, I was actually attempting to summarize the definitions and hope I yeah, got and them I think reasonably right. Yeah, I think. I Tom's description is a decent paraphrasing. That specific term, fully autonomous, is not used in the policy, but the, the gist of it is about right. Um, in the last couple of years, as I've uh, looked into this question, I've been uh, struggled myself what the difference is between a fully autonomous weapon and a semi-autonomous weapon. I think that's important since uh, it seems to be that the uh, major NGOs and the federal government at this time seem to agree that fully autonomous weapons are not a good idea. Uh, so what is a fully autonomous weapon? And in my investigation, I was very pleased to hear a definition tonight, but in my investigation, uh, the answers that I've gotten is that a fully autonomous weapon would be a weapon that came off the assembly line already switched on and ready to kill. And then, no, maybe not that, but a weapon that came off the assembly line already switched on and ready to kill and capable of replicating itself. So we're talking about technology, this fully autonomous technology that to me sounds akin to like a purple striped pink polka dotted unicorn with lime hooves. It's like we agree on something that's pretty far out there that leaves me wondering about the semi-autonomous weapons and how they are distinguishable from the fully autonomous weapon. Is there a question you can yes, just sum um, it up, please? I apologize. <clears throat> what would keep a uh, country or weapons developers from 
designing and building, building a fully autonomous weapon with a particular switch engineered in or a particular switch engineered out and that in the heat of battle, say when you're losing, you can add that switch back in. How can this be monitored? And we brought up the topic of landmines earlier. I think with landmines, the law is, is that once you put them in the ground, you take them out. And we've seen how that's gone. So I'm cynical about the whole idea of uh, laws concerning this technology. Okay, he's, so the question is, can you actually implement regulation and or a treaty if, if they were to come into place? Well, again, it's one of the questions. It's a good question. It's one that we haven't answered. Um, on the one hand, one can argue that um, it's hard to regulate software. Uh, it, you know, you can uh, sign a declaratory treaty that software is basically knowledge that, that you know, you can't detect it with sensors in the way that you can detect a nuclear program and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, the other side, I think, would argue that, um, it, no, you can't entirely uh, control this kind of technology. You know, as, I mean, as you mentioned in an earlier discussion today, you can find YouTube videos of uh, crazy Russians putting machine guns on miniature drones today and having all kinds of wacky fun with them. And, and so somebody's going to you know, do crazy things with this technology that we disapprove of. Um, but in order to field a, um, uh, a robotic army that can do the sort of harm that people most fear, you really need um, the capacity to mass produce and an industrial base to do that, um, to marry the software with the hardware in a way that gives you those millions of, of miniaturized drones that can swarm in autonomous mode, um, networked together. That's a fairly complex and large-scale undertaking. Um, and that therefore, one can, as we have with biological and chemical weapons, not entirely eliminate um, a technology or its use, but um, limit its use in ways that are beneficial. So that's, I think, uh, that would be my description of the arguments on both sides of that question. Okay. Just, I think we have time for one more question. Here in the, the front. I think that the mic's coming down to you. Okay, great. Uh, Olivier de Cotigny, I'm with the Washington Institute. Uh, as Paul said, I mean, the concern about these weapons appeared before the weapons were actually developed, and that's uh, kind of a comparative advantage, uh, given what happened with nuclear and chemical weapons. Uh, how much does that change the uh, non-proliferation or control approach then? Because, I mean, nuclear weapons were addressed, for instance, when five countries already had developed them. And, uh, and what consequence would you... Uh, would you uh, uh, foresee in terms of a, of a le international legal uh, control or a non-proliferation regime for these weapons? So I think um, one of the challenging things about this issue is people are debating like different different components of the issue, right? So one, one question is, are autonomous weapons a good idea, right? And another one is sort of, can anything be done about it in any case, right? It's possible that they're a terrible idea and people are going to build them anyway, so that's certainly possible. Um, you know, unlike nuclear weapons, which are pretty hard to build, it takes a reasonably sized country, a quite a bit of industrial and scientific effort to build a nuclear weapon. Um, I suspect the technology to do this, particularly to do it indiscriminately, which is what you really worry about, is pretty easy. Um, as Stuart kind of mentioned, within a couple of weeks, uh, you know, a decent programmer could build some indiscriminate killing weapon today. Um, I think no matter what reasonable, responsible countries decide to do, whether they decide to say, well, we're just going to let the laws of war, which already prohibit things like that, you know, sort of play out, whether they decide to sign up to some treaty, you're going to, we're going to have to live in a world where there will be um, countries and non-state groups and terrorists that are going to do terrible things with autonomy. Um, we have a ban on chemical weapons that certainly doesn't stop someone like Assad from using them um, and building them. Um, so that's, that's something I think that we need to factor into how we think about this future. Uh, you know, how dangerous are these weapons? How much do we need to be prepared to defend against them? Does that, does that matter? Um, I think those are important things to, to think about. All right, well listen, I wanna uh, thank our panelists for a great discussion. Um, thanks for taking the time today and uh, for sharing your thoughts on what is, I'm sure will be an issue that will um, uh, 
occupy more and more of our time um, and uh, energy in the coming years. And uh, with that, I think that we'll move on to the next phase of the event. Thanks, Missy. Thank you very much.